Formula One is a motorsport of the highest of highs and lowest of lows. When we think about the lowest points in the sport's history, the 1994 San Marino Grand Prix instantly comes to mind. This tragedy is much more recent, so it's thought of much more often, but there was one Grand Prix that was just as tragic back in 1960 in Belgium. This race is the only in F1 history in which two driver fatalities occurred during one race. Today, we're going to be talking about the forgotten tragedy of the 1960 Belgian Grand Prix. After financial troubles for the Spa circuit in 1959, the Formula One championship returned in 1960. There was some controversy to start the event as the organizers invited 20 cars, but Aston Martin refused to come to the extremely fast and long circuit. In 1960, Spa had a much different layout than it has today. It was an astounding 14.1 kilometers long, about twice the distance of the current layout, which is still the longest track on the F1 calendar today. Cars averaged over 130 miles per hour through the windy circuit. So Friday practice began at 5.30 p.m. to allow local residents to return home from work as the racing took place on many local roads. Because F1 was growing quickly at the time and the turnover rate for drivers was super high, many of the participants had never raced on the circuit, despite hosting a race just two years prior. Innes Ireland topped the session with a time of 3 minutes and 55 seconds, averaging 137 miles per hour. This was despite his Lotus not being able to hit maximum revs in the straights due to a mechanical problem. So the speeds were pretty much unlike anything the sport had seen before, other than Indy. On Saturday afternoon, the final practice session came to a halt. News spread through the pit lane of a big crash involving Sterling Moss at one of the most dangerous parts of the circuit, a fast downhill bend at Burnenville. Remember, this was a time with not as much technology, and this was a massive circuit, so news traveled very slowly. The drivers on the track stopped at the scene of the accident and evaluated what happened. Then they would drive back to pit lane, so that was pretty much the only way to really gather information. The pit lane became extremely confused when multiple stories of drivers did not add up, but that was because of another crash at almost the exact same time. Michael Taylor had crashed at La Carrere. On the Burnenville corner, Sterling Moss was going over 130 miles per hour whenever his left rear stub axle broke. This conveniently, or unfortunately, happened at the same time as he hit a bump. Moss's car spun, hit a dirt bank on the outside of the turn, and launched Moss out of his car and onto the road. Moss was taken to the hospital and escaped with only a broken nose, back injuries, and cracked bones in his legs. As Moss was laying across the track at one end of the circuit, on the other end at La Carrere, Michael Taylor's steering column failed and he went straight into the brush outside of the track and struck multiple trees. Taylor was also very lucky to survive, but suffered a neck injury, broken ribs, and a broken collarbone. At the start of the Grand Prix on Sunday, there was mass confusion. Cars were late getting assembled, so the organizers hurried the start of the race. They rushed so much that cars launched off with Lotus mechanics on the track. Luckily, no one wrecked and no one was injured. The start to the race was incredible. It was reported that all 17 cars were nose to tell in the opening laps. Jack Brabham led after starting on pole, and on lap 2, Ennis Ireland made a daring move to pass Phil Hill for 4th after starting in 8th place. On lap 4, Phil Hill stormed past 3 drivers in 1 lap to get to 2nd. After a couple of laps, Hill was looking to overtake Brabham for the lead of the race. So, as exciting as the race was, this is not the focal point of today's video. We'll skip ahead to lap 19 to a close battle in the middle of the field. Chris Bristow was battling a Ferrari. Bristow led the pair by a few inches into Eau Rouge. They went up the hill and into the woods and reached Burnenville Corner. Entering the turn, Bristow lost control of his car and went off of the road. He was flung out of his car, but was not as lucky as Sterling Moss. Instead of being thrown onto the track, he was thrown instead into a barbed wire fence. Bristow was killed instantly. Just minutes later, on lap 25, Alan Stacy lost control of his car for no apparent reason at another turn close to the scene of Bristow's accident. Spectators claim that a bird flew into his path and Stacy's helmet struck the bird. 
Stacy's car hit a dirt bank and went end over end across the circuit, slid down a hillside, and then caught fire. The Lotus burned out completely, and Stacy did not survive. This was undoubtedly one of the most tragic races in F1 history, resulting in two deaths of two young men who had only nine Grand Prix starts between them entering the race. Stacy was only 26 years old, and Bristow only 22. Years later, Ken Gregory, Bristow's team owner, had this to say of Chris. He was bloody quick. Another couple of years, and people would have seen just how great he was. There were quite a few who didn't get over that fearlessness threshold in time and were killed. But Chris was so quick that even in his short time, his talent was all too obvious. He was incredibly quick, but relatively inexperienced, and for such a driver, that was the most dangerous period of all. If he had survived, almost certainly he would have been a potential world champion. He was the early Schumacher of his day. The winner of the Aston Martin Autosport BRDC award is presented with the Chris Bristow trophy in honor of his legacy. Alan Stacey was born in Broomfield, England. Stacey was very quick and had a successful sports car career despite having an artificial lower right leg, the result of a motorcycle accident when he was 17. This raised concern among team owners as he climbed the ranks. Alan was a very nice bloke, cheerful, not complicated. A lovely bloke, a really nice chap, but when it came to Formula 1, he didn't enjoy the proper throttle control which he needed. That was really his shortcoming. I think the cars were getting too much for him. When he wanted to put the throttle down, he had to shift his hips. Maybe his leg would have prevented him from ultimate success in F1, but he proved he had the skills to make it there and be successful in other categories. He was sort of a master at Brands Hatch, capturing many sports car trophies there, and it was the site of his F1 debut. Despite both of these drivers tragically losing their lives in the matter of minutes, Formula One still ran this configuration of the Belgian Grand Prix for eight more years. Finally, it was changed for being unfit for competition. It is surprising to me how untold this story is, and I would never really knew of it before researching this video. Brabham ended up winning the race. It was also the fastest ever race at Spa. There were only 6 finishers of the 17 drivers who started the race. This race was only an addition to the track's reputation of being one of the harder, grueling, and challenging tracks on the schedule, a reputation that is still held and being added to to this day. Anyways guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. I know it was something a little bit different going back to Formula 1 instead of NASCAR, but there will be more NASCAR videos in the coming weeks. So I hope you did enjoy. Make sure you leave a like if you did, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.